Okay. All right. We are live. Um, oh, I guess I can take this off for right now. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us yet again for Ask an Expert. My name is Amanda Rabluski. I'm with Boulder Community Health. I coordinate the PILLAR program. PILLAR is a program um, embedded in BCH outpatient services in the Delacava Family Pavilion under our behavioral health umbrella that helps support folks that are seeking treatment for substance use disorders or the management of chronic pain without the use of narcotics. The way we do that is through service navigation, short-term case management, and some limited scholarship dollars to help fill in gaps where they may exist for um, treatment purposes. To learn more about us or to reach out for support, please visit bch.org pillar. My contact info will also be at the end of the presentation on the resource slide. So please don't hesitate to reach out with um, questions or inquiries about treatment. Um, as I said, welcome again to Ask an Expert. This is our monthly um, educational lecture where we talk about all things related to substances, treatment, prevention, trauma, mental health, pain, um, anything really that could potentially lead to misuse of substances and um, we try to just put information out there, educate the community to make it healthier and safer. So just by being here tonight and learning, whether you're joining us live or watching the recording, um, learning about all of these topics is empowering you and empowering your community. So thank you. Um, in the interest of being transparent, because you all are here, I want to be honest about what tonight's lecture is going to be. So tonight we're discussing the Traeger approach and mind-body medicine, and this is going to go over some things um, related to movement, neurons, pain. Um, well, I'll let I'll speak. I'll let our speaker get into that. But what this is not going to be is an easy answer to any of the things I just mentioned. What we hope these lectures do is give people tools to put in their toolbox to empower them to seek support with whatever they may be struggling with. Um, we want to create safe spaces and let everyone know that there is a community out there waiting with open arms um, for anyone that's needing help around mental health, substance abuse, pain, trauma. So please uh, reach out to us because we can help get you to what's going to be supportive. Um, so as I mentioned tonight, we're discussing the Traeger approach and you can interact live throughout the discussion. Um, there should be a chat box uh, to the right of your screen, I believe. However, sometimes it is wonky and doesn't want to work all the time. So if the chat box is not working, please send um, me an email because I will be the disembodied voice facilitating the discussion and monitoring the questions throughout. Um, my email is a w r o b l e w s k i. I know it's a mouthful, at bch.org. That's A. Rabluski at bch.org. So um, please send questions to my email. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, otherwise, sit back, enjoy. Um, once the discussion is over, there also should be a link to a survey Please take about three minutes to fill that out. We are so generously funded by the Substance Education and Awareness Fund through the City of Boulder. That's what makes these discussions possible. And filling out those surveys really helps us to measure the impact that we're having um, with these discussions. So please take a few minutes, fill that out, send questions our way. And with that, I will um, I'll introduce our speaker, but I'm going to let her talk about her experience and credentials. Um, tonight we have with us Elizabeth Hazelwood. She is um, a nurse by trade with all kinds of fabulous additional certification and working at BCH in the Center for Mind Body Medicine. And she will get into more about what that means and the services they offer. 
So um, give us just one second. We'll switch spots and Elizabeth will take it away. Thank you. Hi, I am Elizabeth Hazelwood. I am the integrative care nurse at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine at Boulder Community Health, also in the Delacava Family Pavilion. And I um, am a certified Traeger practitioner, and I'm also certified in mind-body medicine, which is um, a certification I received through the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in Washington, D.C. Um, let me show the slide here. Um, in the, I did a two-year training at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in Washington, D.C., where I was certified in this small group model teaching mind-body skills um, called mind-body skills groups. And then I've also been a Traeger practitioner since 2004. Um, I was certified while living in New York City and dancing professionally there. So I've been on an embodiment path my entire adult life, including yoga, um, somatic movement, Alexander Technique, Traeger, all kinds of um, learning about the body. And I became a nurse later in life um, and worked at the hospital at Foothills Hospital at Boulder Community Health for many years, worked as a discharge planner and also on the floor, and have found myself the blessing of employment with Dr. Fanestill at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine at BCH. So thanks for inviting me, Amanda, to be here. I'm so honored to be here. Prior to being a nurse, I worked in eating disorders as well as a dance therapist and a somatic movement educator. And I also did Traeger in residential treatment for eating disorders. Um, so I was able to learn about trauma and addiction in that context as well. And um, I think Amanda invited me here today because the particular work that I do at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine really helps to um, teach patients and clients to integrate their mind and their body awareness so that they can make better choices, feel more embodied, and orient more and more toward a sense of pleasure in the body um, and not have to check out of the body through either dissociation, substance use, um, chronic pain is a way of sort of checking out of the body. Um, but Traeger and mind-body medicine practices invite people back into their bodies in a gentle and safe way to learn how to tolerate um, being present in the body and also to regain the control that it's possible to influence your autonomic nervous system as well as various symptoms that show up when there's emotional distress, stress, um, or trauma stuck in the body. So, um, oh, and as I said before, I, before I became a somatic movement, med, movement educator, I was a professional dancer in New York City and also a singer and choreographer. And I feel like my education in the body and the mind-body connection really started um, early as an artist. Many artists can attest to the fact that that mind-body connection is particularly strong when you're used to moving your body creatively or playing an instrument um, or even creating visual art using the body, um, that it develops a sense of meditative awareness, self-awareness, and um, in attunement to yourself that can be utilized to develop um, and guide you um, with uh, connecting you to your inner wisdom. So what is the Traeger approach? Um, I initially got certified in the Traeger approach after 9-11. I was living in Manhattan, and um, my partner then at the time um, was a pilot, and so it was quite a traumatic experience for us. Um, he's also an immigrant. Um, it was a quite a traumatic experience for us to live in Manhattan and experience that, and I immediately became interested in trauma and as a dancer, how I could use the body to help um, people alleviate traumatic symptoms. Um, and so I found the Traeger approach and immediately got certified. It's a somatic movement education um, approach, and it happens in two forms, one through self-guided movements, 
um, and one form passively on a massage table. So the practitioner uses gentle rocking movements, shaking and sculpting to soothe the nervous system. And as we soothe the nervous system, the brain, the unconscious mind, and the auto autonomic nervous system release muscle tension and release holding. Um, soothing the nervous system can also lower inflammation and it brings and teaches the unconscious mind uh, the sensation of um, inner peace and ease and freedom through movement. And I often think of movement as um, intrinsic to life. The only time in life that we are not moving is at the end of life when we are passing. Um, otherwise, every breath, every moment of our lives, our cells are moving. And I think that's why um, the Traeger approach is so effective at reconnecting people to their life force and to that sense of pleasure and ease that can be that can happen when one's embodied, but is more difficult to achieve when they're static in the way like past trauma or emotional challenges or stress. When those things come up, we tend to dissociate and stop feeling our body and look outside of ourselves for soothing. And the Traeger approach teaches us to come back home to our bodies and orient toward ease, pleasure, and freedom through movement. So um, during, you know, one of the other, um, there are several cornerstones of Traeger. Um, one is that the practitioner is in a meditative state while um, doing the, the work. So can, the practitioner connects themselves to I think what's called in Reiki, um, you know, the, the Reiki energy or universal life force. Um, Dr. Traeger, who was a, a physician who developed the work back in the 70s, um, ca called it hookup. We don't use that term anymore for obvious reasons. Um, but it's really important to the work that the practitioner be in that constant meditative state so they can, in a sense, loan the calmness of their nervous system to the client on the table through their hands and through the movements that the practitioner is inviting the client to experience on a sensory level. Another um, cornerstone of Traeger is weighing the body, really feeling the weight of the body. So the practitioner is feeling the weight of her body while the, she's using the weight of the, the patient or the client's arms, legs, head, torso, so that the patient can have a deeper sense of awareness of the weight of their body in gravity and that ability to really ground into being on earth in a human body. Um, so another um, cornerstone of Traeger is inquiry. As, as I'm touching a client's body and moving the body, I'm I'm asking, how does this body want to move? How, what could be lighter? What could be easier? How does this body move? So there's not an agenda. It's very present and um, very based in curiosity and mindfulness instead of fixing or changing. And then the end result of this work is that the person and the brain um, of that person come away feeling um, soothed and with new sensory experiences that they might not have had previously or probably had as a child, um, but have maybe not reconnected to as an adult, but sensory experiences of freedom, ease, pleasure, and softness. So I think how the Traeger approach can be supportive of recovery um, from substance use is obvious in that so often we use substances and many not even not even just substances but any form of addiction to detach from whatever suffering we're experiencing um, disconnect to tune it out and the Traeger approach invites us back in with an ease and a sense of gentleness that makes being present much more tolerable. And it also allows those emotional things that we're wanting to, to stuff under the rug to rise to the top so that they can be held with kindness and um, dealt with in a, in a healthy and meaningful way. So I have a video we're gonna show about the Traeger approach.
And Milton was Dr. Traeger. Dr. Milton Traeger was the originator of the work. For over 50 years, Milton Traeger developed a revolutionary approach to wellness. In his lifetime, he trained and inspired thousands of practitioners in what became known as the Traeger approach. Press and feel, feel much resistance you get And in the decades since, thousands of people who thought their conditions were a lifetime sentence found freedom through the Traeger approach. There was a sense of uh, support and trust, and that was magic, pure magic. This is what stability feels like. So what did Milton know? At TraegerCon 2019, science and clinicians came together to explore the answers to this question. What did Milton know? The body is merely an expression of the mind. The mind is changeable. The state of one mind can impact the state of another mind. This is all transmissible through feeling. Movement conveys information that expands meaning and that can be used to relate an unspoken language. Through this language, Dramatic, even transcendent states of being and well-being can be achieved. Today, science provides fresh insights into the transformative power of the Traeger approach. So we have a physical capacity for the acquisition of learning, and by that I mean the ability to make new connections. I rejuvenate from this. I feel younger. I'm on my way to health. And, and recovery. Milton knew that relief was possible for people suffering with chronic back pain, even for those with the long-term effects of polio, MS, Parkinson's, and other degenerative disabling conditions. There's a child with cerebral palsy who can now play soccer much better as a result of Traeger. Milton was a visionary with a gifted insight into how the body's ability to heal can take place in simple and profound ways. You can feel things, and when you feel things, you can start correcting things. If you don't feel it, then you're just going to go through motions. Do you want to be part of the Traeger tradition? Become a certified practitioner. Experience Traeger directly from a certified professional in your area, and spread the word. Traeger has given me an opportunity to drop what I know and how I've been defined in my identity. Milton knew the secret of an approach that lives on today in the hearts and hands of a new generation of dedicated professionals. Thank you, Milton, for the gift of the Traeger approach. Give you gave you a good idea of what Traeger the Traeger approach is and um, the benefits of it. We do offer private Traeger sessions at the Center for Mind Body Medicine at in, at BCH, and um, for folks who are affiliated with the Pillar Program and have financial need, there are um, so generously provided by Amanda and her program um, grants so that financial um, burdens need not need not be a barrier to learning more about your body and cultivating the mind-body connection through um, private sessions in the Traeger approach. So that brings me to the second certification that I do and the second offering that we have at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine at BCH, which is mind-body skills groups. And this is another um, approach that I originally discovered post 9-11 living in Manhattan when I was Googling around and searching for ways that um, that mind-body skills, meditation, things um, of that nature were being used to heal trauma and to soothe people. 
So I suddenly became very interested in that after being involved in such a traumatic event. Um, so I, but I, unfortunately, I did find this group in Dr. Jim Gordon back then. Um, that was 2002 when I was Googling around. Um, but I didn't get certified until about four or five years ago. Um, and at this point, the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in D.C. has certified thousands and thousands of healthcare practitioners all over the world in this small group model. Um, and none of the exercises when I learned the model, none of the exercises were new to me, but I was so impressed with, with how accessible and how well put together the curriculum was that I decided to go ahead and get certified. Um, and we offer these groups, a new group starting every month at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. So as I said, it's a small group model that was developed by a psychiatrist, um, Dr. James Gordon, who um, w it was on faculty at Georgetown Medical School and graduated from Harvard Medical School and was also um, a researcher at the National Institute of Mental, Mental Health. And in the mind-body skills groups, we, there are eight to 10 people. We meet for two hours a week. And every week we teach, or I teach, a different mind-body skill. And that's really great because seated, seated meditation, sitting meditation is not the only way into developing the mind-body connection and soothing the nervous system. Um, and some people, quite frankly, don't connect with seated meditation or have trouble being that embodied for that period of time um, due to trauma or other sensitivities. So these um, small groups introduce eight different skills, um, all different kinds of meditations, writing exercises, drawing exercises, um, expressive meditations, moving the body, dancing to music, all different ways of cultivating a daily practice, cultivating a deeper connection with yourself, and harvesting that internal wisdom and that insight that can come up when we do carve out time for self-care practices that bring about self-awareness. And really the cornerstones of, um, of mind-body medicine are self-care and self-awareness. And in fact, one could argue that those two elements are necessary to any effective healthcare, whether it's mind-body medicine or allopathic medicine. When a client shows up with self-awareness and the ability to care for themselves through, um, through a daily practice, um, they have so much more information to give the provider, the healthcare provider, so that the healthcare provider can be more of an ally and more supportive. When we lack self-awareness, it's hard to articulate what exactly our needs are and what exactly our struggles are. And so mind-body medicine skills really give us that space to develop a deeper connection with ourselves so we really do know what's going on minute to minute, day to day in our bodies and we can articulate that more clearly. There's also a social, social engagement piece to the group. And many people, some people, not many people, some people are resistant to this um, initial period of 45 minutes of sharing and just checking in with each other. What's going on for you? Um, it's not psychotherapy, though. And what I find is that, particularly in the age of COVID, we have so very few opportunities to have face-to-face -face contact and um, really share what's going on with ourselves and be witnessed in that self-discovery process. And the newest research on the nervous system suggests that that social engagement of face-to-face -face contact expressing ourselves really is the first step in calming the nervous system. And so it's a really important step and um, it is connection to others. And that's how we begin bringing ourselves out of fight or flight or out of freeze and into a more balanced and regulated parasympathetic um, state of being. So the groups um, calm the nervous system. We do have this sharing period with, which, with clear guidelines so that it doesn't devolve into psychotherapy and advice giving and fixing each other, um, but really more about deep listening and witnessing. Um, and then the groups help to cultivate um, a daily practice and hold e we hold each other accountable um, so that we can really show up for ourselves as a profound act of self-care and not a stick that we beat ourselves like, oh, I should have meditated today, but really more like I'm going to give myself the gift of meditating today so that I know who I am and what my needs are and I can better advocate for that before before I get overwhelmed and need to turn to substances or need to turn to, to checking out in some way, whether that be Netflix or Facebook or um, 
substance use. And so we're going to show, I'm going to show a video um, about this organization and Dr. Gordon's work as well. I find it so inspiring. He has taken this work to Kosovo, to the um, West Bank, Gaza, Haiti post-earthquake, um, New Orleans post-Katrina, several schools where there have been school shootings, and he's currently in Ukraine. So the video we're going to show um, is about Dr. Gordon in Haiti with the nurses in Haiti who cared for the um, survivors after the earthquake. They are still living here waiting for help. Without nothing, without any comfort. Any electricity, water, anything. They are just there waiting. Everybody I've met has been traumatized by the earthquake. They've experienced, uh, it's like an overwhelming shock to the entire system. level of depression, of anger, of anxiety, certainly of post-traumatic stress disorder is off the charts. They haven't had any mental help, so it's the reason why we are now everywhere in port au -Prince trying to help. They're all so eager for somebody to pay attention, for somebody to teach them something that could actually make them feel better. The beauty of this work is that it's, it allows people to rebuild from inside and give them a sense of hope. It sounds so little, but it's, it's everything. It's huge, a sense of hope. One person is saying, oh, the soft belly breathing, the relaxed breathing, just made me feel so good and I could sleep at night. And these kids we just visited in the tent camp are saying, I like to do that chaotic breathing, that fast, deep breathing, because I feel more relaxed afterwards. I get rid of my tension and other, others like the imagery where they go to a, a place that's safe and beautiful and they get a respite from the tension they feel and they have a sense of control and creativity. And so they have the understanding that there is something they can do for themselves. Something very simple, doesn't cost anything. Once they've learned it, they can do it on their own. And some of them said they were teaching it to their families as well. It's special because an uh, approach, simple, easy, that anybody could use it. You don't need to be psychologist or social worker to use this model. C'est pour cela qu'il doit continuer avec le travail. Ce n'est que le commencement. J'attends la fin parce qu'il doit retourner encore pour venir travailler avec nous pour que le sourire établi définitivement en moi et en d'autres personnes. This is a program that is for, with, and by the people who are living in this place. Our job is to come here to create the program, to train them, to raise the money for them, to create the context for them to help and heal their own people. Hundreds, thousands of people in Haiti are saying, my life has changed. I can do something to help myself. I feel calmer. I can sleep at night. I'm not beating up my kids. I'm not so worried all the time. I feel like there's hope. Bon, ça vraiment bon pour moi parce que si me pas là dans l'île, me dégueu à folle. I feel this is a privilege to be able to do this work. I got to witness transformation, amazing transformation, and I was able to experience firsthand its power. I think with more formation and MBM, I have a lot of capacity to go to a psychologist and get my own genius because I need that. I think that's what I'm going to do because I'm going to get a message and I'm going to get a benefit for the other people. available 
for folks who are part of that program if they want to join in a mind body skills group at the BCH Center for Mind Body Medicine as well. Um, and if you don't qualify financially, the groups are very reasonably priced. They're um, generously sponsored by the the entire BCH healthcare system. So we're really proud of what we're offering um, at the BCH Center for Mind Body Medicine. I hope you'll join us for some mind body skills development. Um, and I just wanted to talk about a little bit more. I mentioned the parasympathetic. Um, response earlier, but I want to do a little bit more education about that. It's also known as the rest and digest response. And it's one branch of the autonomic nervous system. And it's the branch that um, ideally we shift back into after we have had a stressful event or after we've had a threat to our safety or survival, um, which is is managed and coordinated by the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is that fight or flight response. And so ideally, our autonomic nervous system shifts back and forth between fight and flight and a little bit of anxiety when it's called for, and then back to to the parasympathetic response of rest and digest. Um, but that doesn't always happen with the levels of stress that we have and also with our advanced um, intelligence and our prefrontal cortex. We have developed the ability to make associations and to anticipate dangers and threats, even to our self-concept, not just to our physical body, but to our self-worth or to our um, how we're perceived in the world. And those that intelligence has then developed neuropathways that trigger us more and more readily um, into the sympathetic fight or flight response. If you add on to that trauma or childhood stress, um, then we ha- you can have a lifetime of firing those neural pathways and that become habituated toward being in a fight or flight response. And in the fight or flight response, we have elevated heart rate, we have vasoconstriction, elevated blood pressure, our blood glucose levels go up, um, our digestion slows down, and all of these things, if we live in that state, on a constant basis, all of those things lead to health problems like diabetes, hypertension, um, like digestive issues, irritable bowel syndrome. And so the more that we can um, cultivate the neural pathways that lead us back to that parasympathetic response, to that rest and digest response, um, where um, our digestion is working better, our pupils are a normal size, our bronchioles are a normal size, our blood vessels are a normal size, the more we can prevent those stress-related health conditions and the more... um, feeling of well-being we have in our life. And so the mind-body practices, as well as the Traeger approach, really strengthen those neural connections for a more habituated rest and digest response. So we can spend more and more time in our lives in that calm, peaceful place that's um, commandeered, that's uh, commanded by the parasympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve. And of course, the more that we are in the parasympathetic system, the more capable we are of of dealing with everyday stresses and the more capable we are of um, being present with ourselves and not needing to check out or numb out in some um, self-harming, addictive way. So neuroplasticity is also a cornerstone um, of mind-body medicine and of the, the work that we teach at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. And that concept, neuroplasticity is the concept that the more we exercise particular neural pathways, the stronger they get and the more our brains default to those pathways. And that our um, neural pathways are ever-changing and constantly adapting depending on what behaviors we engage in. So when we engage in behaviors that calm the nervous system, those neurons um, that fire together, wire together, and they create a neuropathway that then we don't, then we can unconsciously choose instead of having to consciously choose to be in a calm state. Um, And so, you know, the newest neuroscience shows us that all sensations that we feel in the body 
are, we feel, because the brain, the primitive brain, the amygdala and the limbic system, have decided that we need to feel them. We used to think that sensations came from the body and were perceived by the brain. But the newest re- neuroscience recognizes that actually information comes from the body, like tissue damage, like tight muscles, um, but that actually the brain does a quick calculation when it receives sensory input from the body, and it decides whether it needs to alert you um, of danger. And it has lots of alarm signals it can use to alert you that you're in danger. It has pain, muscle tension, spasm, fatigue, um, depression, anxiety. These are all alarms that the unconscious limbic system of the primitive part of the brain has designed to notify you that, hey, you need to pay attention. Um, unfortunately, because we're under so much stress all, all the time, particularly with the, the pandemic, those neural pathways for alarm and sensing danger get overworked. And so we can use mindfulness and um, curiosity and kind attention to um, allow those, that sensory input to be um, a, just a part of our experience and train the brain to not panic or react, overreact when it receives sensory input that it previously was habituated to interpret as danger. And so we use these mind-body practices to get off of that wheel of alarm signal triggering a symptom, and then we feel the symptom, we panic about the symptom, and then that sends the message to our primitive brain that we really are in danger, so it better create more alarm messages, so it creates more fatigue, more pain, more anxiety, and then we can stay on that loop of fear about those symptoms, and that increases that um, feedback loop and that habit loop. But when we get curious about sensory input like pain or muscle tension um, or stress, then we can mindfully pay kind attention and get off of that loop. And that communicates to the unconscious mind that it's actually not dangerous to have that sensory input to be present in the body. And then the amygdala, the limbic system can stop creating the symptoms that are really just there to communicate that we're in danger. Because the fact of the matter is, in this moment, I'm not in danger. And I can train my brain to stay more present and be more curious and mindful and have fewer symptoms. And so this is really applicable to the recovery process because um, the typical trigger response is that we have, we experience a trigger out in the world, either a conflict with somebody or something that reminds us of a trauma and our body responds, creates a sensory experience um, without us even knowing that's happening. We're unconscious about it. And then we immediately want to check out of that uncomfortable sensation and do reward seeking. Um, whether that's Facebook, whether that's alcohol. Um, And then, of course, we have negative consequences, which is another trigger. I'm such a failure. How could I do that again? Here I am doing the same behavior that I hate about myself. And you go round and round the typical trigger response. But with mind-body integration practices, we can be triggered. We can experience a negative experience, but because we've cultivated self-awareness, we can feel the body response and we can learn how to tolerate the negative stress response, the tight muscles, the anxiety, the sweaty palms, the discomfort, that feeling of grief in our hearts or that feeling of, oh, I made a mistake, shame in the body. We can feel it because we've cultivated self-awareness and awareness of the body. And then instead of unconsciously just going to that reward behavior, we can take a moment for self-care. We can take a deep breath. We can tolerate the discomfort. We can use meditation. We can use any of our movement exercises, our drawings, our um, uh, expressive meditations to realign ourselves and become more self-aware and then get off of that typical trigger response cycle and get insight about ourselves using our wisdom to understand maybe a little bit more about the trigger and heal whatever negative consciousness is 
um, being triggered, whether that's I'm not good enough or I'm not lovable or I'm going to be left alone. But if we don't have met mind-body practices to create that spaciousness and that self-awareness, we just go round and round and round the loop. So that's all I had in my presentation. I have some resources here. This is Amanda's email if you needed to email her, um, as well as the website for the Center for Mind Body Medicine where you can sign up for groups and you can call to make a session, uh, book a private session. And then also the organizations where I was trained. And then, of course, of course, the Colorado Crisis Line because we always need to have that handy. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, that thank you. was fascinating and informative I, I I had known a little bit about Traeger from you know talking with you in clinic but I learned a lot um, <clears throat> and certainly it just kind of strengthened what I already was aware of and how this can be used as a really great preventive tool but also something that can help people safely reconnect with their bodies because certainly um, a lot of the folks we work with that are struggling with substances or have a substance misuse history um, have a trauma history as well and a lot of that is um, physical or sexual and um, you mentioned disassociating and that's you know what a lot of folks do and um, it's also why they are picking up you know alcohol or cigarettes or opioids or whatever the case may be um so a couple questions but first um i just wanted to highlight a, a few more things from your discussion i really appreciate you um self-disclosing and referring to your own trauma and the collective trauma of 9-11 and certainly think it's it's worth noting that um trauma is so subjective and it's anything that overwhelms your coping and you know it could be on a personal level it could be on this this big level of this you know national disaster and it you know it doesn't have to be I think people get confused sometimes like trauma has to be this one intensive bloody event but no I mean people are still recovering from 9-11 trauma and you know, we'll be recovering from pandemic trauma. The fallout's going to be decades to come. Um, so I really appreciate you um, bringing that up and, as I said, self-disclosing. Um, and then the other thing that I really liked was how you mentioned the social aspects of the groups. And um, so we in at Pillar... I don't know a few of our other um, harm reduction community partners, as well as Dr. Fantasteel, borrow really heavily from Johan Hari mm -hmm. and his philosophy <laughs> of the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, it's community. Yeah. And I would argue, you know, the opposite of kind of anything that is exacerbating a struggle is reaching out right and because so we're social true. creatures and not isolating and finding those with lived experience that you can share with and identify with is what keeps people sober and alive and mm. thriving so um so thank true. you yeah thank you for addressing that as well yeah i appreciate that um so one question kind of you know staying in in the vein of like the trauma discussion, would you say that a lot of the people you see for private Traeger sessions have a trauma history or are experiencing an ongoing trauma? Yeah, I think because um, the Center for Mind-Body Medicine at BCH um, started out with a focus on chronic pain, mm -hmm. um, it's really common for folks with chronic pain to have a trauma history. Um, the good news is that trauma therapy has evolved to the point, and our understanding of trauma has evolved to the point that we now know we don't have to retell that story over and over again. We don't have to continue to identify with the trauma. Mm -hmm. So I don't particularly get into that sure. aspect of my um, clients' lives. Um, but I'm always aware, and the, the services that we provide at the Center for Mind and Body Medicine are very trauma-informed mm -hmm. care. Um, and 
what we know about trauma is that it lives in the body. And so when we address the body, we're addressing the story. We don't need to loop the story and tell it over and over and re-traumatize our brains. Right. We can actually just go to the nervous system response and re-educate, re-educate the nervous system response without needing to dig around in the muck. <laughs> right. It's just so much more of a calculated intervention. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the beginning of your discussion, you mentioned that um, it sounds like the people you're seeing, they're, they're borrowing so much from you with that kind of calming presence and being in such like close quarters. You're certainly kind of sharing energy back and forth. How do you contain that? And how do you manage that? And I guess even further, how do you like keep a good boundary around your practice and your, you know, keeping that separate from, from Elizabeth? I think it's a really important question for any body worker or person in the healing profession. Um, and I am very conscious about it. Um, it does need to be attended to. Um, because so many of us who are drawn to the healing profession are originally empathic and empathic um, and empaths. But what I have learned through my process is that taking on and absorbing someone else's suffering doesn't actually help that person. Mm-hmm. It depletes my ability to fill myself up with light and right. give. And compassion is actually a much more appropriate intervention than empathy. Um, and so when the way I do it is I really, I have a mind-body practice. I have a resourcing practice. I get body work myself. I get acupuncture. I meditate every day. I do yoga on a regular basis. And I'm constantly filling my own container. Mm-hmm. And I'm constantly working my own negative consciousness and healing it as it comes up in relationships and conflicts and symptoms and things like that. So I'm on my own personal process mm-hmm. and um, path. But the most significant thing that helps me, and I do, I clear my field every night at the end of the night using imagery. Um, but the most important thing is to fill myself, like feel my heart energy and fill myself up with divine light and mm-hmm. um, connection to all that is beautiful so that it comes up and overflows rather than going out of me as in a form of depletion. And that way there's also not an inward flow. Right. right, because I'm filling up and I'm, I'm, I'm releasing out, sure. and I'm not t- as taking on as much. Yeah, I love it. No way out but through. Right? No way <laughs> out but through. You got to do the work. <laughs> exactly. Well, and that's something else that, you know, came up for me, when you were talking about, um, really like the neural pathways and working it. It's like a muscle, right? And you have to work it. So at a certain point that's just the pathway and it becomes unconscious these these healthier practices and healthier choices and you know it's the same with recovery right people are waking up every day and making that decision to stay on their recovery path and this just has so many implications for how to strengthen that practice um there's not really a question in there just a thought (laughs) well I really I really want to support that thought because I couldn't agree more um that it's the moments that we go unconscious that we get in trouble yes and so when we have a practice that strengthens consciousness we are able to make so many more choices um it's when we go unconscious that we stop making choices and we just are on autopilot and then we get um, into self-harm behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm wondering, can you share just a little bit more about um, your experience with doing um, private Traeger sessions and th- the change you've seen for people um, over time? Or, you know, generally, you know, what do you recommend? Like, will you see a difference after one session, after three, after six? Or, you know, the long term, is it something that just needs to be done as maintenance, like once a month for folks? Um, You know, I think it's really different for each person. Um, It depends on how much trauma there is. It depends on how much... um, Uh, muscle tension there is, um, how much awareness there is, how much fear there is. Um, And everybody needs something differently. And I really feel that it's important for my clients to be the boss of their bodies Mm -hmm. and to be the boss of their progress and their process. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't um, prescribe particular protocols. 
um, I really try to cultivate um, the client's ability to tune into their inner wisdom and tell me what they need. Okay. And we do a lot of practices in the session, for example, even the choice of do we start face down or do we start face up? I ask the client to feel into your body. What does your body want to do? Mm-hmm. So we're constantly strengthening those muscles, those neural pathways of like, mm-hmm. huh, what do I want? What do I need? Yeah. So they can continue to unconsciously ask those questions throughout their day, throughout their lives. Um, I think as a generic response, three sessions is a really good introduction, like for you mm-hmm. to figure out, is this going to help me or is this sort of like not my thing right now? Yeah. Well, good. I mean, and what an empowering practice yeah. for folks that may have, you know, had their voice quieted for a very long time. Yeah. And so to answer the other part of your question, like what changes have I seen in patients? I have seen remarkable life changes. Really? It is such a rewarding nursing job, especially coming from acute care where, um, you know, acute care is the place where Mm -hmm. people are having the worst day of their lives. Right. Um, And you only see them for two days and then they're off and you don't get to see, you know, you get to see them survive. Right. But that's (laughs) about it. That's not living. Yeah. Um, And in this work, I really get to see patients come into thriving. Um, sure. I get to, I've seen patients who came to me with chronic pain for five years. And after learning the things that Dr. Fan is still teaching and doing some Traeger sessions or joining in the mind body skills groups can report that um, their pain is 80 percent better. Wow. Yeah. That they um, I've had, you know, people come in stiff and, and not feeling their body ever, not moving their body ever to being able to actually like exhale and move their bodies and feel at home in their bodies Mm -hmm. i'm sure it it's 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 got to be rewarding because yeah in acute care it's hard to get a win (laughs) right (laughs) and you need that like you said about filling up your cup it's you know it's hard when yeah you're just seeing people on their worst day Mm -hmm. um so this is a nice way to I'm sure people certainly come in, you know, in in the beginning and it's the worst day because a lot of folks with chronic pain every day is hard. Um, Yeah, it's so true. But to see the delight in people when they recognize that they have more power than they thought they had. Yeah. And that um, they have hope like, oh, you mean I've been in pain for five, ten years. I can actually have a different experience of my body. Yeah, that's pretty inspiring. Well, I haven't had any more questions come in, but I actually really like that an ending on a note of hope because that is, that's what we try to do with these discussions is give people hope that recovery is possible, living without pain is possible, you know, reconnecting with yourself and your body and your life is possible and it doesn't take moving mountains or moving heaven and earth to do it does take work Mm -hmm. right so Mm -hmm. we're not discounting that by any means but courage yes and that's the thing right like reaching out is the bravest thing (laughs) so brave (laughs) and because it's hard and it sucks to feel vulnerable and raw but um you know like i had mentioned in the beginning there's such a big community of people like Elizabeth and, um, you know, our community partners and our funders and Pillar and the people at the hospital, we're, we're ready. We're here. We're waiting. Um, come on down. Yeah. Come see us. (laughs) Um, so yeah, again, on that note, I want to thank you so much again for taking the time Mm, and for all the work that you're doing. And, um, I also want to thank uh, the C Fund again and the Health Equity Fund through the City of Boulder, which also makes Pillar possible, the BCH Foundation, and shout out to Stone Cottage, where we're broadcasting live from tonight and where we broadcast live from every month. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and the fabulous um, folks here. So uh, once again, my name's Amanda. I'm with the BCH Pillar Program. Our speaker tonight was Elizabeth Hazelwood. Please don't hesitate to shoot me an email. Give me a call if there's something that Pillar can help you navigate or connect with the Center for Mind Body Medicine at BCH. Um, Thank you all so much. Thanks.
Good night.